How Venice Wasted $7 Billion on a Failed Flood Defense System In 1966, when Venice was worried about flooding because the sea was rising and the city was sinking, some engineers had a big idea to save the city. They wanted to build something called Mose. This would be a special system with moving walls that could block the sea from coming into the city when the tides were high. Mose was supposed to be amazing, like a superhero, to keep Venice safe from flooding. It was a fancy plan to protect the city's beauty and history. But guess what? The plan didn't work well. It took many years to build, cost billions of dollars, had problems with how it worked, caused problems in politics, and made people ask questions about what was right. And the biggest problem of all, it didn't do its job like everyone hoped. But why did this project that cost $7 billion end up failing? And if spending so much money didn't help, then what on earth can actually come to Venice's rescue? Chapter 1. The Sinking City Venice is a city unlike any other. It floats on water instead of resting on land. It has canals instead of streets. It has boats instead of cars. And it has bridges instead of crosswalks. It's also a city of art and beauty. Everywhere you look, you can see stunning architecture, paintings, and sculptures. But behind this enchanting facade lies a dark secret. Venice is sinking into the sea. For centuries, it's faced the threat of flooding from the rising tides that surround it. The Venetians have learned to live with these floods, which they call aqua alta or high water. They've invented clever ways to deal with them, such as building raised walkways, wearing rubber boots, and installing pumps and valves. They've also turned aqua alta into a spectacle and a tourist attraction, celebrating their resilience and adaptability. But Aqua Alta is no longer a minor inconvenience, it's a major crisis. Venice is experiencing its worst flooding in 50 years. Climate change is making the sea level rise faster than ever before, putting more pressure on the lagoon that protects the city. The city is also sinking faster than ever before due to natural and human causes such as subsidence, groundwater extraction, and industrial development and the result is a deadly combination of forces that could drown Venice by the end of this century. The city's priceless heritage, its economic vitality, and its very existence are at stake. But how did Venice end up in this situation, and how did it become a city on water? The story goes back more than a thousand years ago when a group of refugees fled from the turmoil and violence of the Dark Ages. They found safety in a lagoon, a shallow pool of water separated from the open sea by sandbars. The lagoon was their shelter and their fortress, but also their challenge, how to build a city on such unstable ground. The refugees had a brilliant idea. They drove wooden stakes into the mud and sand, creating a solid base for their stone buildings. They also dug canals and bridges to connect the islands and enable movement and trade. They turned their weakness into their strength and their city into a wonder. But over time, the wonder turned into a curse. The wooden stakes decayed, the stone buildings cracked, and the water seeped in. The lagoon changed too. It became deeper and wider, exposing the city to the fury of nature. This made Venice more vulnerable to the danger of flooding from high tides, which occur when the moon and sun align with the Earth's orbit, creating a gravitational pull that lifts the sea level. These tides are influenced by factors such as wind, atmospheric pressure, and seasonal changes. When these tides strike, water rushes into the lagoon through three openings that connect it to the Adriatic Sea. The water then overflows the banks of the canals and floods the streets and squares of Venice. But this was not an uncommon occurrence. Venice had experienced flooding for centuries, and its people had learned to cope with it. They built their houses on wooden piles that raised them above the water level. They used boats instead of cars to navigate the city. They installed movable bridges and platforms to walk on when the water rose. They even developed a warning system that alerted them of the incoming high tides. However, nothing could prepare them for what happened on that fateful day. The day when they received a warning that changed everything. The day when they realized they had to find a solution quickly. Chapter 2. The Mega Project It was a dark and stormy night on November 4, 1966. The city of Venice was sleeping peacefully, unaware of the danger that was looming over it. 
A massive storm hit the coast of Italy and pushed the sea level to a record high. The water surged into the lagoon that surrounds Venice and flooded most of the city, reaching up to six feet in some places. It was a nightmare come true for the Venetians. They woke up to see their beloved city submerged in water, their homes and businesses ruined, their treasures and memories washed away. The water also exposed the vulnerability of Venice to the world. The disaster sparked a global outcry and a call for action. Experts from various fields gathered to study the problem and propose solutions. They agreed that Venice needed a big plan to protect itself from flooding, taking into account not only engineering but also environmental, social, and cultural aspects. They also realized that Venice was facing multiple threats, such as land sinking, sea rising, and storms getting stronger and more frequent. Now, one of the most amazing proposals was to build a giant barrier system at the entrances of the lagoon that surrounds Venice. This system would be able to control the amount of water that comes into the lagoon during high tides, while allowing normal water flow during low tides. It would also preserve the natural ecosystem of the lagoon and minimize the impact on navigation. The project was called MOSE, which stands for Experimental Electromechanical Module. It was also a clever reference to Moses, the biblical figure who split the Red Sea. Sure, I can add a number of gates in the sentence. Here's my revised version. The idea of Mo's was to have four rows of metal gates that would be installed at each entrance. Lido, Malamoco, Chioggia, and San Nicolo. There would be a total of 78 gates divided into four barriers. Each gate would be 65 feet wide and weigh as much as 660,000 to 990,000 pounds. They would be connected to hinges that are fixed to big chunks of concrete on the seabed. The gates would work like this. When they're not needed, they would be hollow and filled with water lying flat on the bottom of the sea. And when a tide is predicted, compressed air would be pumped into the gates, pushing out the water and making them float. The gates would then rotate on their hinges and rise above the surface, forming a barrier that would stop the incoming tide. When the tide level goes down, the gates would be filled with water again and sink back to their resting position. The project also included locks that would allow some ships to pass through the barriers, as well as monitoring and control systems that would regulate the operation of the gates. Mose was supposed to cost around $2 billion and take 10 years to finish. It was praised as a revolutionary and visionary solution that would save Venice from drowning. But Mose turned out to be a nightmare. Instead of being a source of help, it became a source of trouble. Chapter 3 The Scandal The construction of Mose started in 2003 after a long and heated debate. It was supposed to be done by 2011, but that turned out to be a pipe dream. The project faced all kinds of challenges, from technical to environmental to legal. But the worst challenge was corruption. In 2014, a huge scandal broke out that exposed a network of bribery, fraud, and theft involving politicians, businessmen, engineers, and officials. The investigation showed that millions of euros had been stolen from the project's budget, making it cost over $7 billion. Some of the money had been used to fund political campaigns, fancy parties, luxury cars, and hookers. And some of the money had also been used to pay off journalists, academics, and activists who had badmouthed or opposed the project. The scandal led to the arrest of dozens of people, including the mayor of Venice, the governor of Veneto region, and the boss of the consortium in charge of Moe's. It also led to the halt of work on Moe's for several months, pushing back its completion date even further. The scandal also ruined the reputation and credibility of Moe's. It raised questions about its effectiveness, safety, and sustainability. It also sparked protests and lawsuits from environmentalists, fishermen, residents, and tourists who claimed that Moe's was harming the lagoon and the city. But despite all the controversy and criticism, Moe's continued to be built. The authorities claimed that it was the only viable option to save Venice from flooding. Chapter 4 The Failure In 2020, after 17 years of construction, Mose finally became operational. It was tested for the first time in July 2020 when a moderate tide of 120 centimeters was expected. The gates were successfully raised and lowered, preventing any flooding in Venice. The test was celebrated as an historic moment and a sign of hope for Venice's future. 
but it was also met with skepticism and criticism from those who questioned its necessity and viability. In fact, Mose soon proved to be inadequate and unreliable. Despite its high cost and complexity, it could not protect Venice from all types of flooding. It could only be activated when the tide reached a certain threshold of 110 centimeters above sea level. This was because using Mohs was expensive and complicated, and it also affected the animals and plants in the lagoon. But this also meant that Mohs could not stop the flooding when the tide was lower, but still high enough to flood some parts of Venice, like St. Mark's Square. Another problem was that Mohs could not keep up with the climate change. The climate change made the sea level rise and the weather more extreme. This meant that the high tides became more frequent and more intense. Mohs was designed based on old predictions that did not consider these changes. And since its conception, our understanding of climate change and its expected effects have evolved massively, and the forecasted scenarios that Mohs was built for are now outdated. The scenarios Mohs was made for are not accurate anymore. So, some parts of the city still get flooded, like St. Mark's Square, which turns into a big lake when the tide is more than 80 centimeters above its normal level. This is bad for businesses and historic places, but city officials will only use Mohs when the tides are 110 centimeters or more. This protects about 86% of the city. If they used Mohs for lower tides, they would have to close the gates 80 to 100 times a year, but Mohs is not ready for that yet. And a final problem was that Mohs could not solve Venice's other problems. The system only dealt with one cause of flooding, high tides from outside the lagoon. It did not deal with other causes of flooding, such as sinking of the land from inside the lagoon or rain from above the city. It also did not deal with other problems that threatened Venice's survival, pollution from industry and tourism, overcrowding from too many people, degradation from decay and neglect. That's why, despite the new $7 billion system, Venice still needs to use glass barriers like this. They're 5 meters long, about 1.3 meters high, and they keep the water from getting into famous buildings. They're attached to strong concrete that goes 2 meters under the ground, and they work with pumps and valves to stop the water from coming back in the drainage system. When there's no flood, there are gaps in the walls. But when the water rises, they close them. They're supposed to be a short-term solution until they find something better, and the walls and pumps can stop up to 1.1 meters of water, something Mohs can't do well yet. That's right, the $7 billion system is worse than the simple aquarium walls. In short, Mohs turned out to be a failure, a mega project that cost too much, took too long, did too little, and did it too late. But Mohs was not the only option for Venice. There were other ideas and solutions that could have worked better and lasted longer. One of them was to lift up the land level of Venice by pumping water into underground wells. This idea was based on the fact that Venice's sinking was partly caused by the squeezing of the soil due to the pumping of groundwater and natural gas. By putting water back into the ground, the soil could be puffed up and raised, bringing it back to its original height. This technique had worked well in other cities that had similar problems, such as Taipei and Tokyo. It had also been tried out in Venice by a team of geologists who showed that it was possible to lift the city up by 30 to 35 centimeters, which would make it as high as it was in the late 19th century. Lifting up the land level would have several benefits over Mohs. It would be cheaper, faster, and simpler to do. It would not need any complicated machines or maintenance. It would not mess with the lagoon's ecology or economy. It would not depend on external factors such as tide predictions or weather conditions. It would also deal with the root cause of Venice's sinking rather than just its symptom. But lifting up the land level also had some drawbacks and challenges. It would need to be a careful and coordinated management of water resources to avoid overpumping or underpumping. It would also need a thorough and continuous monitoring of the ground movements to avoid uneven or excessive lifting. It would also face resistance from some stakeholders who had invested in Mohs or who feared that lifting up the land level could change the city's historic character. Nevertheless, lifting up the land level was considered by many experts as a more realistic and long-term solution for Venice's survival but it was largely ignored and dismissed by the authorities who had committed to Mohs. 
As a result, Venice missed a chance to save itself from a watery fate. Chapter 6 The Future Venice is now at a critical point in its history. The city is still sinking and flooding, while Mose is still failing and flailing. The city is losing its heritage and identity, while Mose is wasting its money and resources. But Venice is not giving up. The city is still looking for new ways to protect itself from flooding, with the help of science and technology. However, even these efforts may not be enough. Even now, the Mose is not technically finished. It's been operating for two years in experimental mode. Engineers say they're still completing the last backup systems. And the project, which was supposed to cost $1.9 billion, has ballooned to more than $7 billion and is now expected to be finished in 2025. Venice has a long history of resilience and innovation, overcoming many challenges and crises throughout its existence. Venice can be saved, but Venice needs to act fast and act smart. Venice needs to rethink its strategy and vision. Venice needs to embrace its change and challenge. Venice needs a new Mose, a new model of sustainable excellence. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something new and interesting about this fascinating city and its challenges. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. Until then, stay tuned for our next video.